So hacking is about whitehead hackers. Uh, a lot of people think that hackers is something bad. Um, probably, yes, because it's dangerous. I think, uh, how many people are watching the uh, cool TV series uh, called Black Mirror? Anyone? Okay, so in the Black Mirror, they talk about the future, and there are some interesting series where uh, some hackers are able to control your web camera, to see what you're doing, to uh, move devices. And uh, they say it's future, but it's not. It's reality. So there are these people who have this, this superpower. And the thing is that you, they can either use it to do bad things or they can uh, work for good. And the project, our project is about converting these people with superpower for the blockchain uh, security. And I will tell you how. So hackers is not only, white hat hackers is not only about, uh, you know, hacking the computer. It's also about uh, having a critical mind and question uh, all the processes that are going on in, in for example, this industry. Uh, we are asking questions why this is like this and we try to uh, mitigate all the risks that the bad people don't harm, don't steal money, don't fraud. So cyber uh, today I will tell you about the hackers' attacks, how, what are they, uh, what we face right now in blockchain. I will tell about how we're going to be, pro how, how to protect past experience and uh, hacking solutions for future threats. So the security of the entire system, it's, uh, you can build amazing, uh, uh, I don't know, crypto exchange, wallet, product, but if you don't pay 100% to your security, a small little bug can uh, make a huge harm to your system. So the, as, as the word in here, the entire system is characterized by the safety of the weakest link. So you have to pay like super much attention to this stuff. Uh, right now, uh, on the black market, you can easily go and check uh, for example, web cameras that were hacked, some routers. You can go and uh, maybe your iPhones are broken and they have your passwords. Uh, this showdown, uh, you can use it to check. Um, there are bad sites like this and there are good sites like uh, Heaven Been Pwned. Uh, I recommend you right now to write down this website and to check your email there if you have been hacked. Because if you use the simple password and you don't change it for years, most probably your password is already there. So be sure that you change it frequently. This is a white hat uh, hacker's website. So, but, uh, but what's next? People say that the blockchain is so secure, it will bring another level of security, uh, the transactions go, no d uh, double spending, but blockchain is just a distributed ledger. Yes, you cannot change the data, but around the, this, uh, uh, this technology, there is the uh, products, like the, there is on, online applications, web applications, mobile applications, and they still are written on the common, uh, uh, on the common uh, programming languages. And believe me, like because blockchain is so fast, people are moving with absolutely astronomic speed. They forget about cybersecurity. So we find our mission as a whitehead hackers to bring additional uh, uh, assurance to people that the products uh, are secure. So yeah, and uh, as a result, uh, only from 2014, it's already more than 400 mi more than 400 million USD were stolen. And the numbers that are appearing right now, they're just increasing and they're super incredible. You can see just recent hack, nice hash, 72 million. It was one month ago. Uh, and yeah, uh, in fact, the cyber security attacks, hacker attacks are around four or five years uh, up front from defense. And we need to invest a lot right now in cyber security. Uh, you can see this is online map. And uh, this is how the 
the world is uh, w what's happening in the attacks every second. Every second there is someone he's attacking someone, and people say that uh, the drug dealers they are converting to, into hacking business because it's no more profitable like it is in hack. Yeah, and uh, this is the most popular attacks right now on blockchain. So people uh, search for smart contracts vulnerabilities and uh, uh, crypto wallet hacks, phishing attacks. The most phishing attacks, by the way, this is how I came here, and I will tell you later. And general cybersecurity threats. Of course, exchange DDoS and hack uh, Bitcoin's buffer stealer. This is one very interesting. Uh, when you... Uh, when you want to send the Bitcoin to some of your friends, always remember the first three symbols and the last three symbols of the address that you copy. Because there is already a worm, the hacker's worm, that uh, understands when you copy in something, when you copy the address, and it's, it changes it. And it changes to its address. So uh, when you think that you copied the correct one, you pass the wrong one, and the money goes to hacker. JavaScript miner, mini, mi, mining pools, malicious miner attacks. This, like in Star Wars, the dark hackers, black hackers, and white hackers, they are fighting in every single you know, space of blockchain with completely different techniques. So phishing attacks. Uh, yeah, it's about Gibral network. And um, uh, Gibral network was uh, uh, a victim. And it was a victim because it's big. Uh, big token sale and they uh, just just few hours before the start of token sale some of the uh, fake uh, websites gibralnet and gibralive appeared and they uh, opened their crypto wallets to receive money uh, and not to uh, the, the the customers send it not to gibralnet or to correct but to their own and even on google they p paid a lot of money to be in france so uh, they asked us for help, and we uh, reacted immediately. Um, I will tell later how. So then these guys, they, uh, they have um, designed the new website. Uh, they completely changed the branding, like from blue to, uh, to uh, red, called it Emerald Coin, but they just copied the white papers, the advisors, and everything. So yeah, we have to react quickly, and we had to use our superpower. And boom, as a result, zero money loss. What we actually did? So, yeah, first of all, we had, as I said, to use our superpower. We have to cross the line a little bit for good. Uh, second, we have blocked hosting providers and blocked domain registers. We have uh, used our legal services and uh, used our experience to quickly connect with the guys who, who can do it. Uh, then we put the 24-7 um, uh, tracing of all marketing of the Gibral uh, uh, name in appearance in the, in the Google. So every time in some social media that uh, someone is posting uh, the name Gibral, we were uh, tracing who did it, check, checking if this correct um, correct uh, team, and if not, we were killing them. Uh, next thing is malicious miners attack. I know this world is, is, very, is very unique because miners uh, are right now making huge money, like amazingly huge money. The mining pools are making like millions of dollars per day, and uh, it's quite easy to, to put some bad miners to mining pools which will produce wrong answers and which will stop efficient work of the mining pool. And uh, it's quite new and you have to deal with the guys because where is big money, there is always uh, fraudulent people. We have made the research on how the mining pools can be hacked and how they can be protected. And this, this one is the most favorite one. Uh, this is parity hack. Uh, I remember Talal was saying today about parity uh, multi-sig wallet. Yes, it's very easy to use, and, but it also has bad history because it was hacked already two times. So what happened? Um, uh, one of our team members, he is a, a member of also some bad hackers uh, uh, community chats, and he 
uh, he got the information that the parity got uh, vulnerability in their smart contract, and they were, um, it was able to steal money from these wallets and to, uh, without uh, the permission. So he immediately started to search for the uh, wallets that had this vulnerability and steal the money. But uh, because he is white hat, he had an intention that he steals it so that the black did, do not. And after the, uh, the, the vulnerability was fixed, he immediately returned all the money. People were amazed. So this is the white hat ethical uh, principles that you have to, uh, you know, in your heart, you have to always be with the good side. He could easily keep to himself 1.3 million, and you know, it's a big money, but he didn't. This is Alexei from Ukraine. So, uh, and our project, our project is um, uh, started in Ukraine, is when uh, three cybersecurity teams have uh, uh, merged. Uh, we, ha we have one conference uh, called Hackett, and it's uh, one of the biggest in Eastern Europe for the, uh, for the cyber security. And we also, uh, during this conference, we have, um, uh, we are hosting the stage of Whitehead Hackers Championship. This year, it was 1,300 teams, around four, six people in the team. It's about 5,000 people. So, uh, we invited the best ones to Ukraine for the final, and we run the private closed bug bounty for some uh, payment systems and so on, and so this is how we uh, formed our community. People came from Iraq, Iran, uh, uh, USA, uh, Germany, Sweden, in, uh, India, uh, Arabic Emirates, from all over the world, unfortunately not from Korea, hopefully next year. And we hosted the final, like Steve Wozniak came and some uh, in the biggest aircraft. That was quite cool. This year, I think we're going to do it in Chernobyl. Uh, it's unfortunately Kiev is famous for Chernobyl, but uh, it's quite cool there. Yeah, so we raised some funds. Uh, we uh, we uh, have sold our token at one dollar. Now it's uh, traded around five uh, USD. Uh, what is our ecosystem? Roughly, it's uh, five main directions. It's uh, uh, Hack and Proof, this is so-called bug bounty platform. This is where you can uh, put your smart contract or put your uh, product, and we arrange that the best hackers start to attack it. And after the attack, we are providing with the bug report, with the vulnerabilities report. We target now uh, the crypto exchanges uh, because we see the biggest threat there. Uh, and we, just yesterday, one, uh, at four in the, mor in the morning, I received a call that, hey, hey, uh, one hacker called me, he said, hey, hey, hey we just, uh, uh, we just could, a we were able to stall the database with the passwords uh, and uh, the clients, what we need to do, and say, okay, good, keep it quiet, don't tell anyone, but yes, uh, you, 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 this is what hackers can do. Then uh, it's annual conference, crypto security rating, cyber insurance, and hacking marketplace. I will tell one by one. Key services that we provide is smart contracts, so that products, bug bounty, penetration tests, anti phishing, uh, cyber security researches, and of course, everything that is connected to cyber security for exchanges, ISO, and, uh, and the blockchain products. So the researches that we do, we, uh, we take the best uh, experts in this field. Um, the latest one is Rush for Hash Power. It's about the mining pools and what is going on with the, uh, with the mining industry. And we did it with Berkeley University USA, with Polish University and Ukraine. We, uh, crypto, oh, back. Okay, so crypto exchanges trading. Um, what is uh, uh, the most um, uh, question mark in this, uh, in this sphere is why exchanges are rated by their volume? Uh, why it's, it, it's really like if you try to search in the internet, you cannot find some other ratings except of the volume. Like the bigger volume, the better exchange. But is it correct? 
So wh why we don't use the order book, like how much uh, bitcoins can you buy or you can sell at, this, at one moment? Why if um, the crypto exchange has zero commission, how we can audit that they are not uh, making the bot volume? How we can do it? And why, why white hackers are, uh, care about it? Why, why we should do this uh, uh, crypto exchanges trading? And the, qu the answer is that w if in the future, this year is going to be the exchanges year, and the, the exchange that will provide the most uh, reliable information, openness information, and that will, um, uh, that will not, you know, um, do the fishy games, they will, uh, they will survive and they will become like new, uh, uh, new NASDAQ or new London Stock Exchange, that's for sure. And we see our mission to provide the traders the exact information wh what is what crypto exchange. So we have divided the rating to four uh, directions, is financial, is cybersecurity, user-friendly, and PR. So for the financial, we, we are focusing on the order book, and we are focusing on the uh, price volatility and arbitrage comparing to other ratings. Cybersecurity is the key as well, and we're going to do the tests for their uh, sensitivity to DDoS. We're going to run for them bug bounty, and we're going to uh, check the transaction speed. User-friendly is about withdrawal process and limits and, of course, some special features. And PR is openness, management reputation, and uh, presence of negative news. So, but the next thing is cyber insurance. Yeah, you, you should do everything you can so to protect your system. But unfortunately, you cannot be always 99% sure that you are 100% uh, sure that you're protected. So cyber insurance is a very rising trend and you can uh, insure your own crypto wallets, client crypto wallets and your own data. Imagine if you're DDoSed and you're a crypto exchange and you're down for half a day, imagine how much commission you're losing. And cyber insurance can, can give this commission to you back. Uh, this, uh, this program is, uh, is done with some big insurance company and I recommend you to read more about it. So the marketplace. Uh, marketplace is, the, is what my personal view is what, where the blockchain technology drives uh, the whole market. So by providing the marketplace, by creating the marketplace, you are creating a new sales channel to vendors. You are creating the new uh, crypto market growth because more and more products can be bought by crypto. So the, the, more, uh, the better marketplace, uh, the, uh, the faster the industry is moving. So we target to become cybersecurity Amazon. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, the cybersecurity is so difficult and the owners of the company and CEO, sometimes they, they just, you know, procrastinate this, my favorite word. So they put aside this question and we, we target to provide to them the easy solution. So the business plan that we, uh, we, are, we are having these five uh, directions that we work and we created the project office with separate budgets. Uh, we, gonna, we distribute the, the funds that we raised for three years with some uh, escrow uh, agents uh, uh, in place that will s make sure that we are not spending money flittering away them. And uh, of course, as I'm ex-Deloitte, I'm bringing all these Deloitte guys and we are doing it uh, together. This is our executive team. So you can see me, Nikita Knish, the Yegor Aushev and Vladimir Taratushka. Um, we'll be happy to come here and to share our views and of course we are inviting you to Ukraine. Um, we also have some advisory team with some well-known people like uh, Shahmir Amir is uh, considered to be third best hacker in the world. He's a rock star in Pakistan. 
John McAfee, everyone knows him, Alex Matiasevich, and some influencers in the Bitcoin community. So thank you for your attention. Like, as the picture said, best way to protect is hackers on your side. So once again, once again see, you, see you in the coffee break. Bye. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I'd like to thank Talao and Jabral Network, and thank you guys so much for attending this event as well. This is an amazing time for blockchain, and we're at the blockchain revolution. So I'd like to give a shout out as well to everyone watching on YouTube. We have almost 600 to 800 people watching live right now. This is a very interesting time for everyone in this space. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about objectively analyzing blockchain products, and I'm going to talk about my media angle, which is the alternative media. So I'm not CNN. I'm not the big, big media, but I'm representing a new type of media. And I have a YouTube channel, I have Twitter, and I talk to projects at a person-to-person -person level. So let's take a look at the first slide. So a little bit about me. All right, so I have a relatively large channel on YouTube. I have 150,000 subscribers right now. And my videos have been watched almost 8 million times. So thank you guys right now on YouTube, especially guys if you're watching right now. Um, you've been absolutely amazing to me in this space. Well, my background is in mining. So I started off mining in 2012. So that was quite early in this space. We've got GPU miners, and that's my experience. And that's kind of what box mining, the name mining comes from. Obviously, right now, I just don't talk about mining. I talk about cryptocurrency projects and how to look at these projects. What else do I have a background in? I have a background in the gaming industry. So I used to work as a game designer. I designed video games. And I also have done project management as well. And that kind of helps because, of course, learning about technology as a game designer and as a project manager, I have to understand technology. I have to extend what the technology is and then communicate that with the artists. Because the artists don't, sometimes don't understand all that code, all that GitHub stuff. They need someone to explain that to them, and that's how this channel came about. So let's take a look at some problems facing the blockchain projects that we have right now. Obviously, you guys hear about so many different projects. We just had Eric Gu talk about Bitcoin, and then Bitcoin brought forth all the other coins out there. And of course, there's a lot of problems facing communication with the problems between these projects and, of course, the rest of the community. So first of all, we have the problem of explaining the technology. You know, how many people do you really hear, do you really understand what blockchain technology is? Do you understand the UTXO model of Bitcoin? Do you understand how that's different from what Ethereum is doing? These are highly technical questions, and they need someone to explain that. What's a hash function? What's a private key? These are really important, important um, topics here, and we want to talk about that. So that's something I talk about in my channel. But of course, this is something that you guys should all look into. Read books and learn about it. We also have project transparency. So this year, we have so many different blockchain projects coming to fruition, opening up, and of course, they need to communicate that. In fact, of course, I talk to a lot of my viewers, and we always want to ask more. What can we learn more about this project? There needs to be more transparency in this space. We want to see what their leaders are doing, what their leaders are thinking. We also want to look at team, because this is something I've learned managing teams in the gaming industry. As a team, it's all about how you work together. If the team doesn't work, the project's not going to work. That's simple as that. You can give all these promises in the white paper, but if your team cannot deliver, there's going to be a problem. And finally, of course, we've got industry-specific questions as well. Well, with blockchain, it's not just about one Bitcoin or about Ethereum. It's about a platform that supports a lot of other industries as well. 
And of course, we need industry experts here. So these are the questions that you guys should be asking yourself. All right, how do I analyze a project? How do I ask these questions? And how do I get these answers? So my role in the blockchain media, so I make YouTube videos, and then I, of course, try to solve some of these problems that I identified. So of course, with the first one is with project summary videos. So I talk about projects, and I summarize them in a very short five to eight minute section. And that gives people an idea. And that's not the end of your research, I want to say. This is the start. The start of looking into a project, researching it, and of course, looking at the key factors. I also do visits to different projects. So of course, Binance, um, they're presenting next. I visited their offices. I've also seen Metaverse, two of their conferences, and also Walton Chain as well. I've got more as well. We also want project updates. So I help a lot of projects give updates about what they're doing. I think this is very, very important because, of course, when they're releasing and launching something, we want to look at that, what they're releasing and does that really fit what we want. I think this is all these key things that I want to do in this space. And lastly, of course, I consult with experts to analyze projects as well. So this is kind of my role. It's very different from the traditional media. So traditional media, we got CNBC covering blockchain. We got interviews with different people. But I wanted to bring my personal angle to this. As someone that's in this industry, but also I'm independent of the traditional media framework. I run my own channel. I run everything. And that's what I'm trying to bring to the space. So let's take an example of something that I've done in this space. So I basically look at projects. And one of the projects that I felt was very related to my background, which is gaming, project management, is EngineCoin. So how do they use blockchain technology? This is one of the first questions I ask in this space. It's very important because, of course, we've been talking about blockchain a lot. And a lot of projects, they just attach the name blockchain onto something. But does that mean blockchain is the right technology for that company, for that project? What abilities, what features of the blockchain are they using? So with EngineCoin, they're trying to solve the item of item duplication for gaming items. You know, as a, as a big gamer myself, I own a lot of digital items. And of course, back in the day, we had problems where people duplicated items. And by putting items, digital gaming items, on the blockchain, we can prevent that duplication. See, this is something that's very important. If you guys know Bitcoin, you can't duplicate a Bitcoin. So that's one of the things it's trying to solve. But we also have smart contracts. So smart contracts allows us to do trustless trade. This is something a lot of people still don't understand especially tr being trustless. What does that even mean, right? It might be people, a lot of times they said, yeah, we're moving the central party, like say I'm Amazon. We can buy from Amazon and we trust Amazon. We can trust that Amazon will deliver us the item because, well, we trust the central party. Amazon has a great name. But with smart contracts, what we're trusting is we're trusting the code. We can put a contract up there, and we can initiate a trade with anyone. And that code will guarantee that this transaction will take place. Well, if I change one digital item with another gaming digital item, that transaction can take place. And I have complete confidence that this contract, this line of code, not a person, not an institution, that is very different. An institution like Amazon, they can still change the conditions of the contract. But with a smart contract, it's basically a line of code. There's no person. There's no one with bias, prejudice. It's going to happen in a trustless fashion. So this is something I'm looking for. I'm looking for projects, of course, that use smart contracts correctly, that they're using the technology correctly as well. Lastly, of course, they have additional features. They have ideas for on-chain subscription models. So basically, you can subscribe to a service. And then, of course, they can process that transaction on-chain and keep that maintain that. So they're all allowing people to use this blockchain and to, of course, use it in the proper way. It's not a centralized database. It's going to allow players to own items in their own wallets and, of course, trade that as well. So this is how I kind of look at projects. I kind of make sure that they're using blockchain. And of course, we want to go one step deeper with projects, too. So here, of course, I'm in the game industry. So I kind of have a lot of experience in looking at, of course, projects here. And of course, I had an interview with their CTO. 
And it was a really, really insightful interview because we talked about how they're going to move forward a project, for example, integrating with Minecraft. And as a big Minecraft player, I kind of knew the systems there and what they're trying to do. They're trying to allow basically gamers to develop different mods, different environments, and integrate that with Engine, and of course use that to create items on the blockchain. It allows Minecraft players to own the items that they found and created. We also talked about developer support. This is where I have quite a bit of experience as well. I'm used to develop with Unity, and Unity SDKs are something that we discussed as well. So you want to kind of ask them how they're going to integrate into the existing gaming ecosystem, how this blockchain technology can change that, and the way it's going to do so. And I really want to strongly emphasize this as well, is that for now, a lot of developers still don't know much about what's happening with blockchain with cryptocurrencies and with all this technology, smart contracts, et cetera. And it's important for developers to know more about it. And how they're going to push that is important as well. How they're going to integrate that into Unity 5 Engine, how they're going to get developers to develop for that. And lastly, I do follow up some projects as well. So this is one thing that I think is quite important and sometimes gets forgotten in this whole space which is the fact that we see new projects every day, and we're like, oh, let's research everything new. Let's find something cool. That's what's, what's out there. But of course, we want to follow up on existing projects as well. We want to see if their roadmap is sensible. And I think this is really important, following up and checking, all right, their Q1, what are they doing in Q1? Are they delivering on the aspects? How is long it's going to take? And is the team performing correctly? This all goes back to teamwork. Projects are not about a single person. They're not about one single spokesperson, they're about teams. So of course, this is not the single project I worked with before. I worked with a lot of different people and I've talked to a lot of them. So I want to thank, of course, everyone here for contributing to the channel and getting these people on my channel. So we got Guy Zinskin as well. So Guy Zinskin, he's from MIT Media Labs, you know, the prestigious university in the States. And he, Guy, came up with a really interesting way of doing smart contracts and secure of course, privacy-preserving cloud computing. That's something really strange. And it took a while for us to explain that to the community. How do you put data on the blockchain and protect it? It's like I can put my DNA information on the blockchain on using Enigma, and people can't see what it is, but they can run calculations and see if there's markers for particular diseases on there. So that's kind of a cool project that's been on the blockchain. Of course, I've done interviews and updates with Guy Zinskin. We also have Brendan Eich, the creator of JavaScript. So he came on my channel as well, and we discussed with the Brave Browser what he's creating, his new project, his new browser, and his new, of course, the basic attention token. You know, this guy is huge, right? He created JavaScript, but without him, we'll have pretty much no dynamic pages whatsoever. So, of course, I wanted to follow up. I want to see his vision. I want to see what he wants to create in this space. So, these are kind of the projects I've seen so far. So, this is my channel, basically a screenshot from my channel. This is the people I've interviewed. So, I would say, um, you probably see a handsome guy over there. That's Eric. Eric Wu, he gave a presentation just earlier. We also have Zhao Sunpong, who's over there. Um, Dao Hongfei from Neil. Um, Neil. These guys have all time and talked about their projects, and this is what I want to do in this space. I want to share with you what these leaders are thinking, what they want to do, what they want to achieve in this space, and I hope I can serve the community like this. So guys, thank you so much for inviting me to Seoul. Thank you guys so much online for watching as well, and I hope you guys can learn more about blockchain and everything. Thank你다. Hello everyone. I'm uh, so delighted to be here. And when I walk into this room, I was shocked. I, I really doubt is China the, uh, the most populated country in the, in, the, in the world. Looks like, at least in the crypto world, uh, Korea, Korea is more populated than China. 
I have to introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Da Hongfei, and I'm the founder of an open source project called Neo. So any, any of you heard of Neo? A few, yeah, okay. <laughs> I think that's my job to explain what is new to you. And, I'll, I, and I'm also a CEO and founder of a company called OnChain, and we have a new project called Ontology. So today I will introduce you new, talk about the history, uh, what new is today, and then I will briefly uh, talk about ontology, and then I will comment on those regulations from China. Neo is one of the oldest uh, blockchain uh, project in China. We started in 2014. Before 2014, I was working with a friend called Eric Gu. He just gave his speech right now, uh, just now. We started a group called Bit Angels Club, and we held a lot of meetups in China, in Shanghai. And then we come up with some idea, why don't we build a blockchain and that works for crowdfunding? We was inspired by a post on Bitcoin Bitcoin discuss.org, uh, bitcointalk.org, it's a forum. There's one guy from China, he posted that he want to build the world first ASIC miner. And then he got millions of Chinese yuan, I think that's about uh, equivalent to maybe one million US dollars. And a few months later, he succeeded. He did build world first ASIC miner. And all the investors support him with Bitcoin got a very good return. So we are in inspired by that story. We want to build a blockchain for crowdfunding. That is basically ICO today. At that time in 2014, there is nothing called ICO. We don't even talk about blockchain. All we talk about is Bitcoin. And then a few months later, we got our seed round funding. It's only 90,000 US dollars, very small amount of money. And two thirds of those money come out from the funders and the teams on pocket. As a return, all the seed funders got 10% of the tokens. At that time, the, the investment is only 90,000 US dollars. But today, with 10% of new tokens, you can buy a commercial jet with that token. I checked the uh, news price of today. It's about uh, 130 US dollars. Do you guys know what's news price a year ago, the same day? I just checked. It's only 11 cents. So it's a thousand times gross in price. But the growth is not only limited to price. The community, the supporters, the development of NEO has grown a lot in the, in the last year. Before we launched uh, NEO's testnet and mainnet, we did two ICOs. It's quite different from today's ICO pro uh, projects. We did uh, the first ICO in 2015 and the second one in 2016. Respective, respectively, we got uh, th 700 US dollars and 3.8 million US dollars. It's quite big in 2015 and 2016, but comparing to today's ICU, the size of today's ICU, it's really, really small. And every time we do an ICU, we are about to hit a milestone. So two months after ICO1, we launched the testnet, and one month after ICO2, we launched the mainnet. And then time flies. We spend a lot, lot of time do the hard work be behind the scene. In 2017, we decided to do a rebranding of our old name from Anshares to Neo. And the rebranding is quite successful. We caught attention from a lot of Western crypto uh, communities. They realized that there is a well-kept secret called NEO, and the white paper is very or original, 
the architecture is really different from other blockchains, including Ethereum. And the technology, the source code, has been put onto GitHub for uh, two years. So they are kind of crazy. They changed, they converted their Bitcoin, their Ethereum, their other tokens into new. And we saw a skyrocket of uh, new token price. And then two months ago, we decided to do a give up, a full amount give up. So all the contributors in seed round funding and ICO1, ICO2 will get all their contributions back in the value of fiat money at, at the time when they contributed to the project. That's the history. Now we come to today. Actually, it's not today. It's technically yesterday. Yesterday, I was in a meetup at Yonsan University. I took the screenshot before I went to the stage. And Neil, uh, by market cap wise, is ranked eighth in the world uh, after Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple, and other, uh, other tokens. And we have a very, uh, you can see, everything is red. <laughs> and yesterday is quite weird. We're, we're the only green one. But I guess if you open it today, everything is red. <laughs> I bet you know the reason. I'll talk about the reason later. OK, I'll stop talking about price, because uh, the speaker after me is from Binance, the biggest crypto exchange in the world. So he should be the expert to talk about price. I'll talk about community. Uh, I always say that the key uh, point you need to look at a, pro a blockchain project is its community, especially its technical community. At um, Reddit, the forum, we have over 40,000 subscribers. That's only after Bitcoin and, uh, and Ethereum. And we have tens of thousands of, hundreds of thousands of uh, Twitter followers uh, on Twitter, uh, on Facebook and on GitHub, we have a lot of followers, a lot of folks and the stars. So that's the community. And the community contributed a lot of hard work to us. There are many wallets. There's only one wallet developed by us, but there are several, maybe five to ten wallets developed by the community. And there are different blockchain explorers. There are over there are more than 10 languages translation now. It used to be seven. And there are developers kit uh, of Python and JavaScript. And there are YouTube videos produced by Box Mining and other YouTubers. And there are news portals, there are tools. And more importantly, there are many events like a smart contract coding contest, like different meetups. I just said I, I was in a meetup at uh, Yonsei University yesterday. And this month, there are five meetups in Europe, including Amsterdam, including London, Ireland. And at the end of January, uh, all the team, all the new team are flying to San Francisco. We're going to have our first developers conference in San Francisco. And it's a very big event. I think it's probably about the same size as this one. And it's, uh, besides of all those community contributions, there are, they build apps, they create things. There are some, some uh, decentralized applications as they already finished ICU, and some are about to do fundraising, and some are still in the uh, process of writing a white paper. Okay, I've talked a lot about the history about uh, the current status of NEO, but what is NEO? Why we choose to build a different blockchain? So if you look at closely at the logo, you will see NEO, and there is a fine print under NEO, it says smart economy. And what is smart economy? I, I, I tend to agree with Eric Gu about digital assets. I believe uh, in the future, maybe in five to 10 years, all assets will be digital assets. They will, even those physical assets, 
they will have representative in a digital form. And then we can use smart contract to manage all those digital assets. So we can imagine if you have a department in Seoul, it's very expensive. But if you want to borrow a loan from bank, you need maybe at least a few weeks and go through a lot of paperwork today. But in the future, if the title of a department is recorded in a digital form and you can program it, then you can, do, uh, you can borrow from someone very instantly. Like it only takes a few seconds and probably not from bank but from some stranger across the world you never met with and you don't need to trust him. So in the future, we believe the economy will be smart economy. But there is one catch. If today the blockchain, the, the market cap, the size of blockchain is already pretty big, if we want to grow 10 times, a hundred times, even a thousand times more, I believe we have to connect with real economy or traditional economy. So we need something more than smart contract, more than digital assets. But what is that? I believe it is digital identity. We need digital identity to map the physical asset to the blockchain asset. We need digital identity to map, to bring the relationship between people and people, or people and organization, bring it on chain. So at NEO, the three pillars, the building blocks, the fundamental blocks are digital assets, smart, smart contract, and the digital identity. The best way to explain something, I believe, is to compare it with something you may already familiar. So there, here is a comparison between NEO and Ethereum. I've, uh, NEO is sometimes been dubbed as the Chinese Ethereum. Uh, at first, I, I, I think it's okay. Ethereum is really famous. But gradually, I think I, I'm thinking about why we are doing NEO. There's, uh, if there's already a project called Ethereum, they're about uh, digital assets, they're about uh, a smart contract. So my answer to the question is, uh, fundamentally, we have different design philosophy. Let me show you the homepage of two websites. Uh, Ethereum, he says, it's, uh, uh, Ethereum is a blockchain app platform. So I think the mission of Ethereum, I believe, at first, at least, is to prove that a smart contract is feasible. It's a powerful tool. And I think they did a, a perfect job. But Neil, our mission is to be an open network for smart economy. So we are more down to earth. We would like to link the real economy with technology. And our philosophy is not to be uh, censorship resistant. Uh, Ethereum, Bitcoin, they, are, they want to be censorship resistant, but with NEO, we want to be compliant, or at least compliance ready. Let me get, get back to the uh, previous page. That's the difference in design philosophy. And then it comes down to two main aspects, the technical difference and the economic difference. NEO has different consensus mechanism, has different smart contract system, and then it boils down to a very good scalability. And economically, we have different token system, and we have different governance mode. I want to talk a little about technology. Is there anyone know uh, what's the name of consensus mechanism of NEO? Anybody? Okay, it's called DBFT, or Delegated BFT. BFT stands for Byzantine Fault Tolerant. The beauty of DBFT is it is not forkable. So there will not be any network split with DBFT. And DBFT had perfect finality and scalability. It can consist of 
hundreds of thousands of nodes, and all those, all those nodes will reach consensus in seconds. And today, Ethereum is still doing mining, proof of work, and they will switch to proof of stake. But I think it's difficult for the miners to do such a kind of change. So that's the difference of consensus mechanism. And then we have different smart contract system. The smart contract, uh, if you want to do smart contract program in, uh, on top of Ethereum, you have to learn a new language. It's called Solidity, or other languages like Serpent or other names. But if you are a developer, you can be very easily do smart contract programming on top of Neo. You can use C Sharp. You can use Java, JavaScript, Python, even other languages in the future to do smart contract on top of Neo with those IDE integrated development tools that you're familiar with, like Visual Studio or Eclipse. So it's more compatible, more uh, easier, more lower barrier for programmers to learn smart contract with Neo. And then the performance, the scalability of Neo is much, much better than other projects. Usually, Bitcoin can process three to five transactions per second, and maybe Ethereum, maybe a few dozens. But with Neo, we can process uh, 1,000 transactions per second, and we are aiming a very high TPS in the future. Uh, the aim will be announced at the DaveCon. That's the technical part. Uh, I believe in the next two to three years, there will be a lot of competition between different blockchains, especially public blockchains. And the competition is not about just about techniques. Sometimes it's about the governance, how the community, how the team behind the project governs the project, how the, gov how the project grew, how they evolve. At Neo, there are, the design is very different at, at, at the beginning. There are two tokens, two native tokens uh, within Neo. One is called Neo, the governance, we call it the governance token. When you are a Neo holder, you are the stakeholder of the blockchain. You have the voting power to decide a lot of things, like who will be the delegates, who, uh, how much transaction fees should we collect, things like that, and how many delegates we really needed is a choice between decentralization and efficiency. So if you are holding new, you are the stakeholder of the blockchain. And then there is a token called gas or new gas. It's a utility token. Basically, you use gas to pay everything on new blockchain, like transaction fees, like the fees to deploy a smart contract, like to register a good name, you will need to pay gas. And every new token holders, uh, every new to there is one gas token linked with one new token, but it will be released or unlocked in 22 years. So if you are holding a new token, you will gradually see there are some small amount of gas token unlocked every block. So why we choose to do uh, two token, the dual token system? Uh, the reason is this. Uh, take, uh, for example, if I'm, a, if I'm a, a stockholder of Apple, I own Apple stocks. If I want to buy a new iPhone 10, if there is only one token with a, within the one token system, I have to use my stock to buy an iPhone 10, and then my percentage of uh, of the stocks, of the shares of Apple company just dropped. But with dual token system, your percentage, your stake is always the same. That's the dual token system. And also the, econo the economic model the f about fees are different. Today, when you do a transaction in Neo, it's free, it's completely free. But it is very expensive to deploy a smart contract. Unlike other blockchains, including Ethereum, including Bitcoin, the, their transaction fees are quite expensive. 
two weeks ago, I sent some Bitcoin to a friend, and the transaction fee is about uh, twenty to thirty dollars. It's 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 on par with uh, Swift. It says that Bitcoin will replace Swift, but today the transaction fee is just as expensive as Swift. So we use a different uh, transaction fee model. The business pays for the transaction fees, and the users use the blockchain for free. It's more like the bit, more like the internet premium business, a uh, freemium business model. That's the economics. And then we come down to governance. With DBFT consensus, all the validators, all the nodes, all the people behind the nodes that are in the consensus process are identifiable. You, you will know who they are. So it is more compliant ready. And then we have a virtual organization called New Council we made a very bold decision three years ago. We decided to reserve 50% of all the tokens by new council. It is a very bold decision. At that time, even if you kept 1% token to yourself, you will be called pre-mined. Your coin is pre-mined, and it's absolutely a taboo in the crypto world three years ago but we decided to keep 50%. Why? Because we believe we need these tokens, these resources to foster the ecosystem, to help those dApps to grow, to invest in other projects, other protocols that will benefit to NEO itself. So among those 50 million tokens, 10% will be used to incentivize our team 10% were used to incentivize those community developers, and 50% 50, uh, 50 will be used to, uh, to do investment or token swap, and another 15% will be flexible. So we believe this governance model is more efficient, and you can say it's more centralized. But in the next few years, we will spend those tokens, we will distribute those tokens, and after we spend those tokens or distribute those tokens to community, we will have less say, less power over uh, the new blockchain. And I, I think the governance model is more like Asian countries or Eastern Asian countries. It's more authoritative in the beginning, but eventually it will be uh, democratic. Okay, uh, I've talked about uh, NEO, and then I will briefly introduce the company on chain. Uh, when, when the team is building NEO, a lot of Chinese enterprise, including banks, including local governments, approached us. So they said, uh, can you build a blockchain for us? And at first, we just did it. And then, gradually, we realized it's a, it should be a standalone business. It's an independent business. So me and other four partners, uh, co-founders, decided to set up a company called OnChain. And the product of OnChain is called DNA, or Distributed Network Architecture. It's a template of consulting and private blockchains. You can use DNA to build your own private or consulting blockchain. And there are many use cases, including uh, identity chain for Guiyang government. It's a local government in China, including a proof of concept. We worked for uh, China Clearing, the counterparty of DTCC in the United States. And we also built a digital asset platform for Everbright Security, an investment bank in China. And we have a business called Legal Chain or Fa Lian. It's a use blockchain to do data attestation. Uh, by the end of last year, we decided to do something new. Uh, the new project is called Ontology. Why we are, we, we already have uh, NEO. Although NEO is not owned by on-chain the company or, or controlled by the company, but uh, we, we still decided, we still found out there, there is something missing in the puzzle. There are a lot of companies doing the fundamental, doing the low-level blockchains, and some companies are doing applications, 
but we think we still lack two key uh, services, blockchain services. One is fiat on blockchain. We need fiat on blockchain to do real trustless atomic transactions. If we, if we still rely on banks to do uh, money transfer, blockchain is meaningless because you have to, when I send some digital assets to another party, then we have to go through banks. It's, 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 it's back, to, back to the point we started. So we really need a fiat on blockchain. And all the central banks uh, around the world, many of the central banks, are exploring how to do a, a fiat on blockchain. There's, uh, the other thing we are missing is digital, as, uh, digital identity. So we decided to do a project about digital identity. This is a, a pitch deck uh, back to 2016. So we imagined there will be a world of different blockchains and some basic service blockchains, including digital fiat and identity. But what is ontology? Ontology is the open infrastructure for digital trust. So it's more than identity. You can basically, uh, people and business can do three things on top of ontology. The first is identification. You can control and you can create and control an ID on, on, on ontology. And then the second thing you can do is attestation. You can attach data to other IDs. If you are a, a university, you can attach those qualification data to an ID. If you are an employer, you can attach those work experience to your employees. Even, if, uh, even uh, maybe if you are a blogger, you are a YouTuber, you can attach your, uh, some data to uh, other people. And then the third thing is the mo most interesting part. It's authorization. When you have ID and you control the ID, you can authorize other people to use those data attached to your own ID. And you can authorize who can use it, for what purpose, and how much I should be paid for sharing those data. For example, you can share all those, uh, uh, your spending history with a bank, and they can give you a loan or maybe give you, issue you a credit card. So with these three things, all the data behind you will become data asset. It's tradable and it's valuable. A new and ontology will work together. Ontology will use, ontology is an independent uh, infrastructure, independent blockchain, but you will use the same smart contract system, so you will sh uh, share the same ecosystem. And applications on uh, ontology can issue their tokens uh, with new, and they can use new as a payment rail, and those tokens can be traded in decentralized exchanges in new. Okay, my last slide is about regulation in China. So what is legal? What is illegal? Back to September, China just banned two things. First is ICO. Uh, we need to define ICO first. ICO is raising money with token to general public. So the key word is general public. It is still legal to do private fundraising to accredited investors in China. It is always legal, but raising money to general public is illegal, it, it is banned. And the second policy is the Ch Chinese government or regulator just cracked down all the cryptocurrency exchanges. So doing a crypto centralized cryptocurrency exchange business in China is illegal now. The reason behind it is because, I think it's, there are two reasons. One is the regulation, the regulator uh, just does not really like speculation. In the history of China, or recently, there, are, there have been a lot of speculations and the ending is not quite ugly. So the government is not very like speculation or anything that could be a warm bed for, uh, reg uh, for speculation. And the second reason is, if, if the government license cryptocurrency, a crypto exchange in China like the Japanese government did, 
it will be conflicting with current capital control policies. In China, there is, it's, the capital is still controlled. You cannot uh, move money in and out uh, completely freely. So if a cryptocurrency exchange is licensed, you can buy Bitcoin easily, then you have a way to evade, to, 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 uh, to escape from those capital controls. So it's conflicting with current policies. That's the reason why the Chinese government banned a cryptocurrency exchange. And the tricky thing is about mining. Uh, recently, there are a lot of rumors says that the government is uh, cracking down the mining facilities or mining pools in China. Um, it's, not, it's, it's, it's never confirmed. Uh, my understanding is this. There are many mining factories. They claim to, be, they claim to build a, compute, a cloud computing center or data center uh, with local governments, and they got subsidized by those governments. But gradually, those governments find out that they're not really doing compute. They're not really doing cloud computing or big data center. They're they're merely mining bitcoins, and bitcoin speculation is discouraged by the government. So they stopped those uh, subsidy and asked them to move out of their uh, place. So many of the mining pools, mining uh, factories, are moving out, uh, even out of China. But blockchain, blockchain technology or blockchain development is still encouraged by the government. So uh, Chinese government is very flexible and uh, welcome innovation. So doing blockchain development and uh, research on blockchain technology is completely legal in China. Okay, that's my uh, speech and I would like to end my speech with uh, a line from a futurist called Will Gibson. He says that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And I hope with those distributed blockchain technology, we will see the future very soon. Thank you. Okay, 세계 암호화폐 거래소 1위죠. 바이낸스의 바이낸스 창펑자오 최고 경영자님의 강연이 기다리고 있습니다. 강연 주제는요. 암호화폐의 미래입니다. 큰 박수로 맞아주시기 바랍니다. Um, hi guys. My name is Chen Pen Zhao. I'm the CEO of Binance. We started Binance six months ago. And this is actually the first time I actually flew, took the airplane to attend a conference to do a speech. So I want to thank Josh for inviting me here. And um, the reason I came here is because Josh actually helped us to do the Jap Korean translations for Binance.com earlier. So I want to thank him. Um, so today I will talk a little bit about Binance, uh, maybe five to 10 minutes. Can I see a raise of hands of how many people know Binance? How many people don't know Binance? Okay, I think most people should know Binance by now. Um, so uh, I'll be very quick with Binance, and then I'll talk about a little bit about my vision and how we think uh, projects, especially ICO projects, uh, crypto projects should be run, and what kind of coins we like and we don't like. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about the market. So uh, cryptocurrency is now a 700 billion uh, market cap. Uh, this number is actually a little bit older. Um, I didn't have time to adjust my PPT. Uh, there's about 1,400 coins on coin market cap, but actually we have so far received more than 5,000 applications for coin listings. So there's a lot more coins being made than there are listed already. Um, on a traditional exchange, you do buy, sell, uh, you manage your own risk. Performance of the exchange is not guaranteed and you do your own research, and liquidity is uncertain. So that's some of the problems when we first started, uh, we thought the industry have. We have not completely solved those problems yet, uh, but we're definitely working on it. So for Binance, we, uh, so, some of the, uh, um, so some of the stats for Binance right now. So we are pretty much around the top three exchanges in the world, uh, usually top one right now, but things change. Uh, volumes fluctuate. 
Uh, we started six months ago. Uh, so from our ICO six months ago, um, the token price have actually risen about 200 times. Uh, at the high point, it was about 220 times. And this is at a period where uh, Bitcoin probably raised about seven times. So we actually outperformed Bitcoin by 30 times. But we're still not as good as Neo. They did 1,000 in two years. So um, we cover a lot of countries. One of the things Binance do is we are country agnostic. We want to service every uh, person on the planet. We don't really care which country. We don't, care really, we don't really care which language. Uh, we don't care where that person is. We just, want to, uh, we just want to provide a place for people to buy or to trade cryptocurrency. So we provide as many languages as we can. Uh, we, have a language, we had eight languages before. We took one off yesterday um, due to local regulations in Japan. Um, but we also added, now we added a little box uh, on the top right of our website. Uh, now you can Google Translate our website. Um, I think the Google Translate is probably, probably not as good as Josh's translation, but it's pretty good because we don't have a lot of words on our website. Um, so we just surpassed 6 million users so, uh, as of this morning. Um, and this is with limited registrations. So every day we open registration for about one to three hours, depending on, uh, and we open them at random, random times so that we don't have an inflow of people wanting to register. So uh, I think last week we had a record of in one hour, 240,000 reg users registered. And that record was passed again a couple, uh, 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 two days ago. We had uh, 310,000 users registered in about an hour and a half. So we have very huge volumes. We listed 237 trading pairs so far, actually a bit more than that now, uh, probably around 240, 245 trading pairs. Uh, we support about 100 coins, so that means we have to work with 100 different wallets, 100 different blockchains. Um, that's a very challenging part for running a crypto exchange. Um, and we have our own Binance coin. Uh, there's some other data I want to share, which is not updated here, I apologize. So uh, on the highest day so far, we traded 10 billion US dollars. Um, in 24 hours on Binance.com. And if you divide that by uh, 84,000 seconds, that works out to be $1,100,000 uh, $1, traded every second. So every second, uh, $1,100,000 trade. And on that day, our matching engine processed 3.5 billion transactions. So that's 40,000 transactions per second uh, on our exchange, on average. So at the peak, it was actually much higher. So this is something that a centralized exchange can actually do technically faster. Um, I, as of now, I actually don't know of any exchange, any, uh, not exchange, any blockchain that can handle 40,000 transactions per second. So that's a challenge I want to put out there for the blockchain developers. I wish there will be a blockchain that can handle that many transactions per second. And when that happens, we will very likely move to a decentralized model, uh, on-chain uh, exchange. Um, okay, I'll quickly go through this. Um, I don't think we need to spend too much time on this. So we want to build a different exchange. So if we want to just build another exchange, uh, copying somebody else, uh, we probably wouldn't do that. Uh, there's not a whole lot of point. So we want to build a different exchange. So um, just some more stats. So we have a really fast matching engine. So our core matching engine for the, uh, for the exchange is actually really, really fast. We can handle 1.4 million transactions per second. So on the top, so this slide is again, again a little bit outdated. On the highest performance day, we used about 3% of our, of our capacity for the, for the matching engine. So we are actually doing upgrades for that now because we want to be ready for another 100x, in, 100x increase in volume. So uh, we are working very hard on those uh, lower level uh, things that people don't see. So this is why I think most people who have used Binance, when you trade on Binance, the response is very quick. From placing order to the order appearing on the right in the market data, um, I think that experience is most people like it. Um, we are really tightening up our listing criteria. So this is where there's some conflict. A lot of projects come to me, hey, it says Champion uh, CZ, can you look at my project? It's a really good project. Can we list on, uh, on you? So I'll spend a, the next little part talking about how to list on Binance. Um, <clears throat> so 
currently, I think we are one of the highest liquidity providers in the world. Um, some other exchanges, to be honest, um, have very large volumes on some pairs, but they don't have a lot of liquidity on all pairs. I think our volume is very evenly spread out uh, among many, all, almost all the pairs we support, or at least most of the pairs. And um, um, I think if you trade on multiple exchanges, you'll, you'll find, out, find that out very quickly. I think this is a major uh, attractiveness for Binance. So if, uh, this is actually much, much more important than trading fee, low fees. This is much more important than um, uh, other things. This is actually real money that you will save when there's hard liquidity. Uh, we are one of the exchanges that we are, even though I don't travel that much, just simply because the time cost for traveling is too high, we do engage with the community very heavily. So I think we are the first exchange that did community voting for listing coins. Um, I'm very often in our Telegram group, but less often now. The Telegram group is too big. Um, right now, I think there's 40,000 people, and whatever you say does not stay on screen for more than two seconds. Just keep scrolling. Um, so, but we are very engaged in, in, with the community. Um, so I want to talk a little about, so we have two initiatives we started. We haven't, um, I want to spend more time pushing this kind of initiatives, but I actually got dragged back because the number of users increasing is too fast. So I, we want to service them better. So I've been more focusing on the service part of Binance.com. But let me talk a little bit about labs because it does um, indicate how we select projects. So we like projects that are technically based. So strong team, very active code base. Uh, we can see, we want to see them, we want to see the source code on GitHub and we want them to be very active. Um, funds is never an issue for any project we like to support. Uh, for any project right now, if Binance says we will incubate you, fund, money is not a problem. There will be, there will be lots of money following us. So, uh, we will give you advice on token econ uh, the token economy. Um, what does that mean? That means how to structure your uh, funds, how to, how to raise money, how much to raise. How, if you want to do a token or if you want to do a coin, how much of that should be public, how much should, of that should be uh, private, how much of that should be reserved by the team, how much should be reserved for mining. We have seen uh, quite a lot of projects. I think we're probably one of the very few groups in the world that sees a, lo a lot of projects not only at the investment stage, but also after you do the ICO, after you list, after you trade, um, how does your market performance uh, perform? Remember, ICO is only the beginning of your project. It's not the end, right? You, once, you take that, once you take that money, you got to do something useful with it. So we can give a lot of devices on how to do that properly in a proper manner. And we want to see teams deliver a prototype before they do an ICO. So we don't like the, all, all of these uh, ICOs where there's just a white paper, is a concept. Uh, we don't like that. Um, so Binance uh, Lab is the pre-ICO incubator fund. Uh, we don't, and then that will naturally grow into Binance Launchpad, which is the platform where you do a public sale. For public sales, we really don't like big ICOs. Uh, so if you want to raise $100 million, uh, we are probably not going to do that project for you. Uh, we want projects to be small. We want, no matter how grand or how, how famous your team is, we want a project to be between five to $20 million. I think that's way more than enough money than most startups need. And why we do that? We want you to leave value on the table so that there's room to grow in later. Uh, we have seen that many of the, I think I published the uh, article um, two, three months ago about, uh, on Steemit saying I don't like big ICOs and then I, uh, the tether uh, problem, other problems happen afterwards. So, uh, but those are the problems that we would like to avoid. We don't want, we don't want projects to realize their full value at ICO because what happens then, once you get on the exchange, the full value is already being uh, uh, realized. Um, people are not going to buy it anymore. The price is going to drop, and we don't like that. Um, it's not technically speaking, it's not our problem. Um, it's the investors decision to buy or sell, but we don't like projects that don't perform well on our platform. So, um, so we like small ICOs. And once you raise that amount of money, which is plenty for most projects, we don't release that funds to the projects right away. So this is the same case for Gifto and for Bread, who, two of the projects that went uh, through the ICO on our platform. 
so far they only got 30 percent of the funds they raised. We hold the rest 70 percent. So they have milestones to, to deliver. Once the project delivers the, those milestones, we will release the funds in batches. So this way, if the project runs away or could not deliver, they do not get all the money they raised. So this is a incent it's either an incentive or a penalty for the project to perform. So they need to deliver, right? So we want to see projects deliver their product. So after they uh, deliver certain milestones, we release the funds. So every project is slightly different. So this is a model that we like to uh, encourage. So let me circle back. Uh, is there a back button? So let me circle back a little bit to how we do listing. So when you, when the, right now because we have too many projects, if you have a project that you want to list on Binance, there's a web form. That's the only entrance. So talking to me does not help. Say, hey, CZ, please listen to my pitch. I have a really good project. That doesn't really help you. Um, I will not be able to remember your project. I will not be able to relay what you said to me to our review team. So we have a review team, and we do not allow our review team to have contact with the outside world. Nobody knows who they are. Uh, projects team are not allowed to talk to them. Um, the, pro the only way project teams can interface with them is to submit the form with useful information. So that's why the web form is really, really important. And because the review team is not allowed to have contact with outside world, and there's a very good reason for that, um, they cannot ask you for more information. So if you submit that form, make sure you have every piece of information that you want to submit and keep it short So because they're quite busy. So it's a tricky problem. You've got to present the most useful information in the shortest amount of text possible because they're quite busy. Uh, why we don't allow them to interact? Um, I, I think in the last three days, I have more than three people coming to me and say, CZ, I'll give you $2 million, US dollars, to list this coin for me. I said, no, um, submit the form. So I don't need any more money. Um, but so we want to avoid that kind of situation. And we want, a lot, we want to remove any influence or any bias from our review teams. Once the review team our internal review team will have a score. We do not disclose that score to anybody. So once they score a project, then the, uh, we have another business development team that gets in contact with you, say, hey, um, now your, your project passed our review. We want to discuss some commercials. We charge a listing fee, and we will, uh, we will list. Um, so that's kind of how the process works. Uh, it is a very much a black box to people outside of finance. Uh, but it is what it is, uh, because we have too many projects, there are too many projects who are trying to do different things. Uh, lastly, once, even after we discuss the commercial terms, let's say we agree on a fee that you, you paid, we do not tell projects when they will list. It's just waiting. So, but we usually list pretty quickly. Uh, but if you see any projects claiming they will list on Binance by a certain date, you can be pretty sure that that's not going to be true, because we will not list on that date. Uh, we will most likely cancel the listing. So that's kind of how we work on the listing. And um, in terms of the future, I want to share a future vision that I have, which is I believe in the future there will be many, many coins. I think there will be millions of coins, uh, regardless of whatever people do. I believe almost every country, every province, every company, every organization, every team, every project, every person, and everything can issue a token. Um, some of them will be valuable, some of them will not be valuable. Um, and once you have a token, you need liquidity, you need price determination, and you need an exchange. So I think the exchange space for future blockchain uh, economy will be huge. And we have a pretty good head start on that right now. And we want to maintain our start. So um, for anybody who's... But, to realize that dream, we got to make exchanges much, much faster. Binance.com right now is not fast enough for that. So we still got to make Binance.com quite a bit faster, uh, at least 100 times more faster. So we're still working on that. And decentralized exchanges will come, um, but I want to take this opportunity to sort of explain to people what my vision of the decentralized exchanges are. Many people confuse this concept saying, oh, decentralized exchanges are better than centralized, just because decentralized is always better. That may not be true. Um, so today, 
none of the decentralized exchanges can handle our volume. That's number one. And none of them are as secure as we are, actually. So Ether Delta got hacked uh, many times and very badly recently. Um, so uh, it's not that decentralized by itself will be more secure, more fair, more be better. That doesn't work. Also, decentralized exchanges and centralized exchanges are two different things. They're, in my mind, they're more like trains and cars. Right? So if you invent a train, you might still need cars. So with, this, with decentralized exchanges, you, are, um, you will have some benefits, anonymity, um, and um, uh, you, can, you can trade any coin you want to trade. But right now, there are a few very heavy challenges for decentralized exchanges. Number one, the blockchains are not fast enough. They can only do a couple hundred or a, uh, a couple thousand transactions per second. And that's not fast enough for trading. And with, blo with, um, with blockchains, multiple nodes have to sync. When multiple nodes have to sync, they're by default always guaranteed to be slower than one node that just does the processing. So it's very simple. So, um, and with decentralized exchanges, you will see a lot more fraud, a lot more bad coins listing on there, and a lot more price manipulation, bad behaviors. So some regulation is actually good. Um, but again, so, that's, so that's kind of my view on decentralized exchanges. I hope Binance.com will begin our decentralized exchange development in 2018. But so far, we have had a lot of concepts, but we haven't really started our GitHub repo. We haven't really started our development yet. So that's probably going to come. I'm hoping that we will be able to have the bandwidth to start that project in 2018. Um, the, last pro the last topic I will talk about is what I touched on is regulation. So a lot of people are very curious as, about, uh, as to the regulation affecting uh, exchanges. Um, it does. It does affect us very heavily. So, but uh, Binance always takes the stance that we will be fully compliant in every country uh, for the, uh, where we operate. We respect every government. We respect every law enforcement agency. So we don't want to fight anybody. We're just here to provide a good service to people who want to trade. So um, as different, uh, on the flip side, um, I highly urge different regulatory bodies to sort of consider the consequences of regulating uh, poorly. So uh, there are good regulation and there are bad regulations. So some people always ask me, do you like regulation or not? It's not again, it's not a binary answer. It's not regulation is good or regulation is bad. It's how you regulate, right? So a good regulation needs to be detailed, needs to be spe specific. You, can, you should say what you can do and what you cannot do. If it says that you cannot do everything, it's probably not very good because um, that, just, that basically means all the blockchain businesses or all the exchanges will leave that country and do it somewhere else. And when, um, when all of those projects go to a different country that's more favorable, uh, that has more favorable regulations, what happens? The projects follow them, the teams follow them, the talent follow them, the money follow them, all the funds follow them, and all the employment opportunities follow them because all the good projects have to hire people they help the local economy, and then they pay, they pay taxes in the local economy. So closed, super closed regulations are not good. We can look at neighbor countries where they closed off the internet. That probably didn't do very well. So, um, but too relaxed, no regulations, also not good. I think as a human species right now, we're not at a stage where we can fully regulate ourselves uh, in a harmonious ways. There are a lot of bad players. There are a lot of scammers. Um, there, are, uh, 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 there are thefts. So we still need some type of regulation. We still need some rules in the society to, to make our society a, uh, a good one. So uh, my view on regulation is never binary. I do not hate regulation. I do not say um, we don't need regulation. I also do not fully welcome all kind of regulation. So I think we just need to uh, play by year. We will observe regulations in every country. We will, uh, we will respect them. We'll respect all of them, even the bad ones. Um, and then we will just have to find a place where we can operate fully legally. So that's pretty much our, uh, my vision. So um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them now or outside later. Um, so thank you very much for having me in Korea. Thanks.
네, 바이낸스의 창펑 자우님 감사드립니다. 네, 여러분들 장시간 의자에 앉아 계시느라 힘들지 않으셨나요? 어느덧 저녁 시간이 되어서 출출한 분들이 많으실 것 같습니다. 이것으로 블록체인 혁명 2부 세션을 마무리하고요. 만찬 시간을 갖도록 하겠습니다. 만찬은 뷔페식으로 준비가 되어 있습니다. 행사장 로비에 만찬이 준비되어 있으니까요. 음식을 가져다가 자리에 오셔서 자유롭게 드시면 되겠습니다. 그리고 기자 간담회에 대해서 잠시 안내 말씀을 드리겠는데요. 6시 20분부터 6시 20분부터 4층 행사장에서 기자 간담회가 진행될 예정입니다. 이 정해진 시간 안에만 진행될 예정이니까요. 참석을 희망하시는 분들은 에스컬레이터 타고 4층으로 이동하여 주시기 바랍니다. 간담회장 입구에서 프레스 비표를 확인하니까요. 꼭 착용하시기 바랍니다. 그럼 저는 잠시 후에 찾아뵙도록 하겠습니다. 즐거운 식사 시간 되시기 바랍니다. 감사합니다.